Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. This is another in this occasional series of readings from and brief notes and commentary upon Eusebius of Caesarea's The Ecclesiastical History. Here is Book 9 and Chapter 8. The customary rains, indeed, and showers of the then prevailing winter season were withholding their usual downpour upon the earth, and we were visited with an unexpected famine, and on top of this a plague and an outbreak of another kind of disease. This latter was an ulcer, which, on account of its fiery character, was called an anthrax. Spreading as it did over the entire body, it used to endanger greatly its victims, but it was the eyes that it marked out for special attack, and so it was the means of blinding numbers of men as well as women and children. In addition to this, the tyrant had the further trouble of the war against the Armenians, men who from ancient times had been friends and allies of the Romans. But as they were Christians and exceedingly earnest in their piety towards the deity, this hater of God, by attempting to compel them to sacrifice to idols and demons, made of them foes instead of friends and enemies instead of allies. The fact that all these things came together all at once at one and the same time, served to refute utterly the tyrant's insolent boasting against the deity. For he used to infirm insolently that, on account of his zeal for the idols and his attack upon us, neither famine nor pestilence nor even war took place in his time. These things, then, coming upon him together, and at the same time, had constituted the prelude of his overthrow. He himself, therefore, was worn out, along with his commanders in the Armenian War, while the rest of the inhabitants of the cities under his rule were so terribly wasted by both the famine and the pestilence that 2,500 Attic drachmas were given for a single measure of wheat. Countless was the number of those who were dying in the cities, and still larger of those in the country parts and villages, with the result that the registers, which formerly contained the names of numerous rural population, were now all but entirely wiped out. For one might almost say that the entire population perished all at once through lack of food and through plague. Some, indeed, did not hesitate to barter their dearest possessions for the scantiest supply of food with those better provided. Others sold off their goods little by little and were driven to the last extremity of want. And others again injured their bodily health and died from chewing small wisps of hay and recklessly eating certain pernicious herbs. And as for the women, some well-born ladies in cities were driven by their want to shameless necessity and went forth to beg in the marketplaces, displaying a proof of their noble upbringing in their shamefacedness and the decency of their apparel. And some wasted away like ghosts of the departed, and at the last gasp stumbled and tottered here and there from inability to stand, and fell down. Then, stretched out prone in the midst of the street, they would beg for a small morsel of bread to be handed them, and with the last breath in their body, cry out that they were hungry, finding strength for this most anguished of cries alone. Others, such as were regarded as belonging to the wealthier classes, amazed at the multitude of beggars, after giving countless doles, henceforth adopted a hard and pitiless frame of mind, since they expected that before long they would be suffering the same misery as the beggars, so that in the midst of the marketplaces and alleys, dead and naked bodies lay scattered here and there, unburied for many days, presenting a most piteous spectacle to those who saw them. Some actually became food even for dogs, and chiefly for this, this reason those who were alive turned to killing dogs, for fear lest they might become mad and turn devout to devouring men. But worst of all, the pestilence also battened upon every house, especially those whom the famine could not completely destroy because they were well provided with food. Men, for example, in affluent circumstances, rulers and governors and numbers of officials who had been left, as it were, of set purpose by the famine for the benefit of the plague, endured a sharp and very speedy death. So every place was full of lamentations. In every alley and marketplace and street there was nothing to be seen but funeral dirges, together with the flutes and noises that accompany them. 
Thus, waging war with the aforesaid two weapons, pestilence and famine, death devoured whole families in a short time so that one might actually see the bodies of two or three dead persons carried out for burial in a single funeral train. Such were the wages received for the proud boasting of Maximin, and for the petitions presented by the cities against us, while the proofs of the Christian zeal and piety in every respect were manifest to all the heathen. For example, they alone in such an evil state of affairs gave practical evidence of their sympathy and humanity. All day long, some of them would diligently persevere in performing the last offices for the dying and burying them. For there were countless numbers and no one to look after them. While others were gathered together in a single assemblage, the multitude, the multitude of those who all throughout the city were wasted with the famine and distribute bread to them all so that their action was on all men's lips and they glorified the God of the Christians, and convinced by the deeds themselves, acknowledged that they alone were truly pious and God-fearing. After these things were thus accomplished, God, the great and heavenly champion of the Christians, when he had displayed his threatening and wrath against all men by the aforesaid means, in return for their exceeding great attacks against us, once again restored to us the bright and kindly radiance of his providential care for us, most marvelously, as in a thick darkness, he caused the light of peace to shine upon us from himself and made it manifest to all that God himself had been watching over our affairs continually, at times scourging and in due season correcting his people by, me by means of misfortunes, and again, on the other hand, after sufficient chastisement, showing mercy and goodwill to those who fix their hopes on him." Here ends book nine and chapter eight, and we'll move on to some notes and commentary. This chapter describes a time of famine and plague and even war that came after the renewal of persecution of the Christians under the tyrant Maximum. First, there was a drought that led to an unexpected famine, and after that, a plague. Eusebius says that the plague came in the form of a fiery ulcer, which he describes as an anthrax. It especially attacked the eyes and blinded many. In addition to famine and plague, there was also war as the tyrant attacked the Armenians, formerly ancient allies of the Romans who had embraced Christianity. Eusebius sees all these events as divine retribution against the boasting of the tyrant against God and the faith, since he had claimed that his worship of the gods would protect him from such calamities. The population greatly suffered during this time with widespread starvation due to the famine, dead bodies piled up in the marketplaces and alleys. The plague came on top of this so that in every place uh, it was full of lamentations. Funerals were constantly held with burials carried out for two or three at a time. So through the two weapons, famine and pestilence, death was visited on many. What is more, during this time, the Christians once again distinguished themselves from the pagans by their exercise of sympathy and humanity. They cared for the dead and dying. They shared their bread with others, so that even the pagans took notice and glorified the God of the Christians. Again, Eusebius sees all this as the providential hand of God. From a thick darkness, the heavenly champion of the Christians, God himself, caused the light of peace to shine once again upon them. In conclusion, uh, Eusebius in this chapter not only describes the further sufferings that came in the wake of the renewal of persecution of Christians under the tyrant Maximin, but he also interprets these events as divine judgments on the persecutors. It is noteworthy that Eusebius says the Christians were particularly praised for their ethics. Soon the suffering would end and Christianity would be embraced and it would triumph in the Roman world. Well, this brings this episode to its conclusion. Hope that this has been helpful for those who are listening, and I will look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Till then, take care and God bless.